Outdoors Queensland respectfully acknowledges the traditional owners of the lands where we gather across the state. I myself, I'm in the Anusa, so it's the Gubby Gubby people, so where, where I am. And we are, pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. And we acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples play on the land, sky and waterways used for outdoor activities. So as I was saying a minute ago, I'm Mark Squires. I'm actually the operations manager here at Atlas Queensland and Dom is on leave this weekend, or this, for the weekend, but yes, and for today. Uh, as I said, I, I normally monitor and feed in links and earls and whatever else to the chat during the, during the session. Won't be happening today, but I will make sure I cover everything that we cover in the session by email afterwards. Just like to welcome you all here today, and I'll just there's a couple waiting to come in, so I'll just admit them too while we're waiting. Well, I would uh, welcome you, particularly if you're a member of Outdoors Queensland, and if you're not, you're more than welcome a to be here and b to consider joining at some point. Um, the the recordings and all the notes and links that uh, that we share. On, this, on these sessions are shared later on our Coffee and Conversation page. And that link will be in the email that you get this afternoon as well. And for those who keep count of these things, this is our fourth session in 2021. February is just about done and dusted, which is reasonably scary when we, when we were only a few weeks ago, looking forward to 2021 and the, the new positive things it was gonna bring. So our, our agenda for today, uh, there are a few things to cover off. None of them major conversations or topics, but things to, to cover through anyway. And if you have any comments to make or thoughts to add, please do jump in and say so. So uh, first of all, our AGM is on the 17th of March in Brisbane at the uh, Scout Centre in Auckland uh, we're also running it online, and if you're a member, you've been sent a link already to RSVP, and we would love to see you either in person at the Scout Centre or online. Um, there is a, a new part of the process this year. Um, as you know, we're now a new organisation in Outdoors Queensland, and we have a new constitution, and that constitu constitution requires us or requires members to fill out this form, the Notification and Covenant form. And that form is part of the RSVP process. You'll do that first, then you'll roll into committing to coming along to the meeting or not. Um, we would prefer you to do it online if you possibly could. It just makes our kind of management a little sharper and a little easier going forward. Um, that new form, just by the way, uh, will, will be sent out to all members, all financial members, because it, all new members need to fill it out uh, every year to keep, our, keep um, our records up to date. It's a bit of a pain in the neck in some ways, but it does mean that uh, we always know who our, our current representatives are in our, in our member base. There have been situations in the past where we've sort of lost contact with some members because, you know, the person who was the rep has resigned or moved on or whatever, and, and it just gets lost. Uh, one of the things that uh, is coming up is this uh, skills and training needs survey from the, um, oh goodness me, I forget what it stands for, AQIA, doesn't matter. Um, the, uh, this is a, a survey that follows on from uh, work done previously and it is used to inform the government on appropriate training and investment uh, going forward. Uh, the link will come to you after the meeting today. Uh, I would highly recommend you get online and do that. It's not a particularly onerous form. We did it, I think, yesterday afternoon. So it's, it's reasonably straightforward. But it does give the AQAA and the government a, an idea or another look into what, what you're needing from them in terms of providing training and investment in training. Uh, another thing that's uh, on the horizon is the Uploads Research Project. Uh, uploads, for those who haven't come across it before, is a, uh, a research program uh, being run currently out of the Univers University of the Sunshine Coast. And it stands for Understanding and Preventing Lead Outdirect 
Lead Outdoor Accidents data system. It's a bit of a mouthful, but they are doing some good work. And some of the reports they have available on their website are actually worth having a good look at. Uh, quite illuminating, some of them. Uh, this particular research project they had planned originally for uh, 2020, but like many things, it got put off uh, in 2020, but it's now back on, on track again. Um, so if you are involved for your organizations in safety management, design, uh, and development of safety practices, they'd love you to, to be part of this uh, research. The dates are there in front of you. I will make sure they're in the, e, uh, the email that comes afterwards as well. Just gonna admit Vincent into the meeting. Welcome, Vincent. Now, I'm not sure if Dave Chitty is with us today. No, he's not. Um, he and others have been um, making, making some noise about the, the need to review paying conditions for outdoor staff and, uh, you know, probably timely. Uh, and the OCA have taken this on board and are running a national summit in May, sometime in May, that's the dates and the venue are yet to be confirmed 100%. Uh, but some of the topics that to look at at the summit are uh, training pathways, accreditation, marketing, paying conditions, not surprisingly, and retention of staff. Again, issues that have been, have been quite uh, pertinent uh, following, I guess, the, the downturn in our sector in the last, uh, last year or so. Uh, it will be held in Sydney. Um, if you're interested in attending, then you should talk to us in Queensland or if you're outside Queensland, your, your peak bodies. Um, I think the idea is that the OCA uh, board members or council members uh, will be able to bring along a certain number of people each. Um, and uh, so you wanna, you wanna contact your peak bodies, us here in Queensland. Right, so one of the questions that came out of the last meeting was what is the state of play with the Ural Ringtail Conservation Project, which is a bit of forestry land just outside uh, Noosa, to, to between Noosa and uh, Pomona and Boreen Point and that kind of triangle. Uh, it has been handed back to, uh, Noosa, or to Noosa National Park, becoming National Park. Uh, and somebody asked what was the state of play. So I've had a look, look into it. Um, the details of what it, what it means are there. It's quite a significant chunk of land being recreated as National Park, but it's going to take a long time. Um, I actually, it's just down the road from me, so I went and had a, a walk there a couple of days ago. Um, and a lot of the trails are closed, there are locking trucks all over the place, trees coming down. You know, they are working hard to remove all the pines. There are lots of uh, wilding pines, I've got to say, though in all sorts of places, which will, I suspect, be an, an ongoing drama for national parks for a while. Um, but it's underway and we, we can't really expect to see anything positive out of it in terms of actually a national park for another five to 10 years at least. Another question that was posed two weeks ago, uh, was it Gavin, would you ask this question? Or is it somebody else? It doesn't matter. Uh, Lip Falls uh, in the Denham Scenic Reserve up near Beachmont, uh, apparently quite a popular swimming hole. And there's apparently there's a, um, uh, a downstream abseiling walking uh, route. It's quite, quite fun to do apparently, but it is now currently closed. Uh, I've try, tried to find out who's actually closed it and what the, the state of play is, whether we opened up again. And nobody really seems to know or is prepared to um, kind of take responsibility. Scenic Room Council, it's in their council area. They don't know anything about it. They say it was closed by Department of Defence. National Parks don't know anything about it. It's not their responsibility. They say it's Scenic Room Council. So <laughs> it seems to be a bit, of a, uh, a bit of a mess. Having said that, I've done a bit of research and according to TripAdvisor and several other uh, sort of activity uh, sites, Although it is closed, you can still go there and people are. Apparently there's a hole in the fence. So 
for those who were interested, there you go. Look for closed, but unofficially open. Yeah, Mark, it's Graham here. Yeah, Graham. So, Hi, mate. The, the walkway down to, from Denham Falls uh, down to Lips Falls is the area you're talking about up, up, up there. Uh, got closed by a landowner who had a legal problem with people crossing his land. Uh, to go down to Lips Falls. He was worried about litigation if someone gets hurt, hurt down at Lips Falls. He's also rebuilt fences, right. et cetera, there. Um, and there's um, two organisations that have permits through his legal um, team to proceed to do um, canyoning trips uh, and trips down to Lips Falls. However, in saying that, the wider populace has gone and made a route around the, the fence line of his land. Now his land actually goes down, crosses the creek and goes up the gorge on the other, on the uh, eastern side of the, the back creek. Um, and mm -hmm. so he doesn't he doesn't want people crossing his land. Everyone that crosses there gets videoed and it gets reported to the police. Um, the police regularly check cars parked there. Um, and my suggestion to everyone is to not go there um, other than to go to the, the actual um, Denham Reserve Lookout, which looks back towards Denham Falls. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Graham. And that's a that's a fair comment. I think that in the sector, those of us professionally working this game, yeah, we should be keep, should keep out of there, but we should also be aware that there are people going down there regularly as well. Yeah. Thank you, Graham. Uh, about uh, 10 days ago, we had a call from a member up north who had just had a visit from a workplace health and safety inspector looking at ropes course and zip line terminations. We've been trying to find out from Workplace from WorkSafe Queensland, you know, what's going on and haven't had much response from them. Uh, but this is likely to follow the fatalities and the reports were put out two years ago, 2019, about zip lines and zip line terminations. Um, I will share a link in the email following uh, to a safety alert that uh, WorkSafe Queensland put out in 2019 about um, rope scores and zip lines. Uh, but basically what they're saying is that, as I've quoted there, all zip lines, including the terminations and anchorage systems, should be designed or verified by a suitably qualified registered professional engineer of Queensland. Uh, and it appears that they're now following that up and checking. Um, has anybody uh, come across this? Anybody been aware of it? It would appear not. Okay. Um, I, would, I would suggest that if you have a ropes course, um, that you might want to be ready or prepared for a visit from WorkSafe. It, it would appear they are doing a bit of a, doing the rounds. Um, and it would be, be, uh, be, what's the word? Well planned to, to, to be ready for them. The Brisbane off-road cycling strategy. Um, two days left to provide feedback if you're in Brisbane and you're interested in this sort of stuff. Uh, we have put in a submission and that's on our website and I'll provide the link later as well. Um, what they're trying to do is a good thing. There's some shortfalls, but uh, have a good look at the, the strategy and make comments if, if you're into mountain biking or off-road cycling and are interested. Has anybody else had a look at it and put a submission just out of interest? Yeah, I'll, I'll comment on that, Mark, if I may. Um, oh, that's fair at it and um, from a horse rider's perspective I'm very concerned about yes. this strategy not, not not so much the overall strategy but some parts that they um, are recommending for long-term and short-term uh, release of more trails um, for the detriment of horse riders and a lot of walkers I have concerns about so I've put in a fairly comprehensive submission to the Lord Mayor um, chair Good. of the environment and Chair of Environmental Parks, um, the Pullman Ward Councillor and the project team. Um, it's not that we're, as you know, opposed to um, uh, 
uh, sharing trails, quite the opposite. Um, but there's some areas out there that I believe are quite unsuitable uh, for what they're proposing in the long-term strategies um, and, and generally a lack of consultation with other user groups. I can assure you there's been no consultation with horse riders, um, certainly from our association with the uh, you know, planned losing of trails that will um, will eventuate from this strategy. But more than happy to work with the council to look at how we can find suitable um, ways around these. Um, and that's what I'm pointing out to them because, um, so, uh, you know, some of the trails, specifically in the Colo region um, and um, Brisbane Forest Park, you know, have been, uh, you know, historical horse trails and walking trails for many, many years without cyclists. And when I look at the overall strategy of where they're planning to put all of these bike trails, whether they're single trails, skills parks or whatever, um, is going to be a net loss for other user groups, which I find to be pretty unfair. So um, just putting it out there, so. Yeah, no, no, fair comments. And, and what yeah, happen is- Sorry. What will happen is exactly the same thing that's happened in Daisy Hill and other Redlands um, areas where we were able to safely park horse floats and now we've got nowhere to park and unload horses. And when we do, we get into trouble because we're taking up, this, you know, other user groups, some um, parking spaces, which were historically belonging to, you know, were able to be used safely by horse riders. So in essence, we're not very happy um, and there's been a lot of um, pushback from uh, residents in the BCC area um, and also in the wider areas. Sure. And that's, it. I'm sure, exactly what they want to hear or they need to hear. Perhaps they don't want to hear it, but they need to hear it. Um, and I'm not sure that they have that much consultation until this point, until this uh, request for people to look at the draft. I know that Denise yeah, and from Ember um, has concern not I much have. either. Yeah, the concern I have with this, Mark, even the response I got back from the project team this morning um, left a lot to be desired. Thanks. Um, find it now. But basically it was along the line of, yes, we'll take that into consideration. Thanks for your submission. We'll take it into consideration before the final one's planned. And I've responded back saying, well, I hope you're seriously going to take undertake some serious consultation with other user groups. Um, prior to this plan being, um, you know, finalised. So. Mm, mm. Yeah, it does sound like a bit of a, um, a form letter, doesn't it, that response? Yeah. That's, a, that's yeah. also the same sort of um, submission we're putting for Bushwalk in Queensland too. It's is very cycling-centric. It's not doesn't really cater for horse riders and uh, walkers. Yeah, I guess it is, to be fair, it is an off-road cycling strategy, but that, they do need to take into consideration clearly other users, horse riders and, and, um, and, yeah, walkers, and, and walkers. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's great to have it. I, I, you know, and in my letter, I've stipulated, I think it's fantastic, the actual, the, the concept of the off-road cycling strategy is great. Um, it's clear when you read the strategy that there's been a lot of... Um, unauthorised trails being built by cyclists, which, you know, we need to stop. Um, you know, whether it's being built by cyclists, walkers or horse riders, unauthorised trails are just not acceptable in any standard. So, um, you know, and my fear is that, you know, what we're doing is we're supporting, you know, that um, poor behaviour by opening up more areas. Um, and, you know, I can say that probably... Um, you know, it's probably safe to say that more areas, there will be more off, um, unauthorised trails built in already what we'd consider be relatively pristine areas. Um, so that, that really concerns me. Um, so we're just supporting, um, you know, poor behaviour by just a few, you know. I'm not saying every cyclist is doing that, um, but obviously... It just takes a few to start going on a trail before, just like it does a horse rider to, you know, to make an un, unauthorised trail or a walker for that instance, if the, if the trails are being used a lot. You know, this isn't completely anti-bike riders because anyone that knows me knows I'm not. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just think that everyone needs a fair um, process um, you know, in terms of consultation. And if they are taking over trails, 
that have been historically for walkers and horse riders, then our groups need to be spoken to. Excellent. Thanks, Claire. Anybody else wanting to comment on the strategy? Okay. Uh, fair play vouchers. Applications are closing in the middle of next month. So if you are uh, involved with or have clients who uh, could benefit from um, some, uh, some financial support, then I would recommend you look into this. Um, I'll provide the links again in the, in the, uh, the email that follows this. Inside the Outhouse. Well, you always do a plug for Inside the Outhouse. I went to their website yesterday and tackling the burning questions of the outdoor community seemed like a good um, tagline. I thought I saw Pete Smith uh, on our, on earlier on. Perhaps not. No, sadly. If you haven't been to the Outhouse, um, it's, it's worth a visit. Um, Hello, I, Mark. Um, I'm actually here. You are there. Good man. Excellent. Yeah. Hello, hello, point. everyone. <laughs> would you would you like to tell us a little bit more about where things are at with the outhouse this week? Uh, yeah, uh, it's very exciting times in the outhouse this week. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, we we tackled the uh, wages pay debate, which, uh, as people know from uh, social media chats on uh, various uh, Facebook forums and various other. Uh, chats around the campfire is very topical at the moment. Uh, this week we have uh, a small presentation, or hopefully a large presentation from uh, outdoor people for climate action uh, inside the outhouse. Uh, so hopefully uh, you can come along, uh, listen to Damien Angelupo uh, talk about uh, what outdoor people can do for climate action. And uh, then we'll have a discussion following that. Um, check out our website inside the outhouse or on the various socials. Thanks very much. Have a great day, folks. Excellent. Thanks, Pete. And we're rattling through these, uh, these topics, which is, uh, which is good news. Um, if you do have questions or, or other comments to make, do jump in and make them. Uh, this, the, the, the roadmap, or the roadmap as it used to be called, the Queensland's COVID safe future, nothing has changed uh, since the last time we spoke. Um, other than it's sort of business as usual, uh, our new usual, uh, and that we still need to be aware of things like social distancing and mask wearing where appropriate and hygiene and so on. Similarly with the COVID safe plans, there have been no changes since uh, December, I think it is now. Um, there have been, we have been in some discussion or having had, have asked uh, Sport and Rec some questions regarding upgrades to the education plan, seeking clarity on the question of uh, school group, uh, where we deal with school groups and the way we deal with other groups and haven't heard anything back on that, sadly. So still waiting. And as soon as we do, of course, we'll share that information. Um, the, I think last week, uh, two weeks ago, rather, Dom did share the, the change of email address. I don't know if anybody's had to use it, but if you're looking to looking with specific questions for Sport and Rec on anything to do with the, the plans, that's the email address to use. And uh, site visits. I know that uh, Dom and I both attended a site visit at the um, Sunshine Coast Rec Centre a few months ago uh, by the Public Health Unit, and I know others have had them. Um, probably a good thing to, to get involved with uh, or, get, or have done um, if you're looking to be proactive and, well, you know, that's the says proactive site visits, be proactive in terms of the way that you're, you're dealing with clients and, you know, getting the, doing the right things. Um, and we are happy to uh, come along and be part of your uh, visits or meetings with the unit. Um, clearly, um, probably most most readily in the southeast Queensland corner, um, but uh, we're certainly happy to support you in those as well.
Well, we've, we're halfway through our time, a lot of time, and we're pretty much at the end of our, our list of topics, which is I'm not sure that's a good thing or not. Um, so I'm going to open up the floor. Is there anything else anyone wants to talk about, things that we could perhaps address or look into for, for next time? Um, bearing in mind this is a conversation and not necessarily just a presentation monologue. Uh, yeah, Danny. just that. Oh, yeah. Oh, Danny, you're probably going to say what I was going to say. So you go ahead. No, no, you you go. Yeah. There's just that ongoing uncertainty about whether multi-day events involving accommodation yes. require a specific COVID safe event plan, and it would be really good for that to be worked out with Queensland Health. Yeah, and that that is we've been asking those questions, and we are we are. We, in fact, I think Dom had a call just two days ago uh, from somebody saying, no, they hadn't heard yet and they're still looking into it. It's all trying to work it out. So, yeah, again, it's we understand that it's an issue and that's a drama, uh, but we are endeavouring to get it, get an answer. But we just haven't got it yet. I'm Has anyone got any experience on how long it takes for that email reply to come back from Sports and Rec? Because I know Andrew sent one in, I sent one in. I got the auto reply to say they'd received it and would get through it in due course. But um, no, no other response. No, no response from Sport and Rec. No, no. Okay, well that's that's good to know. We'll we can follow that up as well because clearly that's not good enough if they're going to supply the the, the number or the. Uh, address for a contact they need to get back to people. Um, it may well be that they don't have an answer for you, but uh, they should at least get back to you with something other than a, a rote, a rote uh, reply or, or nothing at all. I might um, be able to provide some input on that. Yep. Thanks, Ben. Uh, hi. Yeah, my name's Ben. I'm uh, from Woodfordia. We're the hosts of the Woodford Folk Festival, traditionally, pre-COVID-19. Yes. Um, event space in Woodford in Queensland. Uh, one of the reasons I sat in on this actually is because of some confusion around accommodation provision. Uh, we've received the directive from Queensland Health just yesterday that they uh, will be enforcing in our case that we would need to lodge a, a full COVID safe event plan where there is multi-day use of the venue so to put it in event terms, we could have un up to 1,500 people on site tomorrow under a checklist. Uh, but if we have six people staying overnight for an event, we need to lodge a COVID safe event plan. So that's essentially where it stands from an events perspective. That, that, that will vary, no doubt, for accommodation providers who only provide accommodation. But, but ours is a curly one because... Um, well, we can accommodate uh, up to 20,000 people on site. So it's a fairly unique beast in that sense. Uh, but I guess we, we posed the question and said, look, we're, you know, if we've got um, 65 people coming to, to an event, where do we fall? Uh, and, and they've ended up resolving and being fairly apologetic about it, but saying, yes, you'll need to lodge a COVID safe event plan. So Ben, I'm not sure how things work out out at Woodfordia there. So this is you're looking at a one-off event, or are you? Is your venue available for regular use by various groups? Uh, well, yeah, that's that's what we're looking into, and unfortunately, because of the scale of the place, it's it's very suited to large-scale audience. So normally, we might have up to thirty-five thousand people here on a on a typical day at Woodford Folk Festival. Uh, and it's quite hard to scale back uh, to something that's suitable. But the, we've just recently cancelled two medium scale events that we had coming up, our Easter Bush Time series, which is essentially a camping experience um, mm -hmm. with the Wood 40 in touch, which is workshops, live music and, and various other things, uh, along with our planting festival cancelled in May. Uh, simply because uh, the, the financial risk is too great for us as a not for profit organisation to bear. Uh, subject to the potential for a, a cancellation 24 hours prior to the event. Um, and we experienced that in the, in the recent Christmas just gone by where our fourth camp, which would have ordinarily been where we might have returned uh, some profit, uh, was cancelled a day out because of the lockdown in Greater Brisbane. Um, so we've become acutely aware of that, uh, I guess, and, and as a not-for-profit, it's not prudent for us to, to proceed with uh, too much risk, I guess. 
Um, yeah. So, and we were we're exploring the idea of other uses for the property. Hence, my my sudden interest in outdoors Queensland, um, because it, it has been suggested here that we have a suitable venue for many things, from mountain biking through to um, outdoor adventure. You know, for many reasons. So, I guess we're we're scrambling to to try and find what's next for us because events uh, don't look like they're they're on the horizon for us at the moment at the scale that we need to make them. You know. Yeah, and I guess um, some of the other folks will will have, would have comment on the fact that you know your venue is your way. You've you had the big scale events, and you're looking at some new events, you know, scattered throughout the year. But people like Danny, for instance, and, and Andrew have running venues that you know have groups in every week, almost every day. Um, and you know, are those groups coming for an event, or are they coming for an education experience, or and, and I think that's part of the, the question that needs to be um, addressed. Well, on that, then, um, then just uh, thanks for sharing that, and thanks for giving us an insight mm. to what you're facing, and also that you're what you're thinking about. And have you got any any indication then that if you were to refocus and turn away from festival type events into I guess what we'd say is activity based or accommodation that they indeed wouldn't be applying the same requirements to you is that your understanding that's correct if if we my understanding is that it if we the predominant uh purpose of the facility became for example accommodation we would then fall neatly into uh, an accommodation category i suppose although i noticed that the i guess i, guess I was a little bit surprised to look at the tourism and accommodation uh, industry COVID safe plan, uh, which which appears to be largely uh, directed at uh, tourism operators, I suppose, rather than accommodation providers. I'd, I'd anticipated seeing 30 pages on how to provide accommodation, what the regulations are for everything from caravan parks to outdoor education providers. But it seems there's a lot more documentation in regard to transporting people in vessels, for example. Yeah, that's, that's what surprised me. Yeah, and I guess that's why we're left in that grey area of trying to interpret or read between the lines of, you know, if we provide outdoor, indoor activities, or indeed in our case with a conference centre, if you're providing something that's not a festival, but it might have an entertainment aspect to it that occurs even just in a day booking, not a, mm -hmm. an accommodated camp, you know, wh where does that sit? And one could argue, yeah, it sits under tourism accommodation, it sits under auditoriums or whatever, but it's not that clear, is it? Like, no, that's right. Danny, can I ask, do you, do you do multi-day events? Can you cater for multi-day? Yeah, we do. We sleep 250 on site, so nothing like your scale, Ben. But um, so a multi-day event for us might look like what's at Andrews at QCCC. So it might look like school kids in residence doing outdoor activities. Sure. But it might look like a group of like-minded people playing a musical instrument or, you know, enjoying a hobby together for multi-day. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, it's very hard came unstuck a little bit was that I guess we were trying to um, suggest to the organisers of the events that we've got coming up that were smaller ones that we said, look, just come along, you guys can use the site. It, it, this was something that we're just doing completely on the side. Come and do something nice and easy. But then I'd, I'd noticed in the legislation that for an organiser, for a host or a venue owner to allow more than 50 people on site, regardless of whether that's a commercial nature or a private nature, uh, is is against that legislation. So mm. that was where it became a... I'm not sure where you're seeing that. I'd be a bit curious. Mm. Yeah, yeah that's, that's in the business undertakings. Um, but, I mean, our context is we're operating under the outdoor education industry plan, um, and we are primarily an accommodation venue, and there's confusion because the public health unit decision tree suggests that anything that fits the definition of multi-day event involving accommodation and shared facilities needs, you know, a COVID safe event plan. And so people are applying for COVID safe event plans for like nine or 10 people on a one night stay, which yeah. I don't think is the intent of it. Um, but then if you go into the events framework and drill down into it, it suggests that you don't need a COVID safe event plan 
for what they call an indoor event of less than 500 people, which for a facility like ours are 300 beds, that's everything we do. Because primarily, most of the time spent is indoors, whether it's dining, meeting spaces, accommodation. And then obviously our, our activities are run under the outdoor recreation plan. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, the, the chief health officer in a press stop three days ago said unequivocally, we now know it's almost impossible for the virus to be transmitted outdoors. Like mm -hmm. that was in a press conference. So, mm -hmm. Can but, I but the, wor the wording around this multi-day event does make it sound like festivals involving tent camping, but the, they're not using precise wording. So people who are running a camp see the word camping without tent in front of it and think that applies to a camp in a, you know, in an accommodation venue. Yeah, and very much the event, this, the um, COVID safe event plan is, is which, uh, we, which we've completed too now in Lodge, but it's clearly very tailored for something that resembles a festival. Uh, it's, you know, they talk about access for emergency services, crowding points at entry and exits, uh, those sorts. Civil disturbances. Uh, what's that? Civil disturbances. Civil disturbances, exactly. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and so it's clearly tailored for that. And I think our conversations with Queensland Health, they've acknowledged that there's no uh, question there's a gap. Um, and I guess I see it as, and probably particularly in, in your industries, it might vary from mine a little, uh, would be something fairly urgent to resolve for clarification on that because it is quite, um, it's quite an onerous undertaking for organisations not doing 35,000 people. You know, in, in our case, it would, it would involve uh, engaging staff for cleaning of amenities three times a day and all, all sorts of things, you know. I mean, we have yeah, enough time. It's a huge amount of work just to get the event plan. Um, we, we've got someone who's submitted an event plan for our facility mm. and, you know, they keep coming back to us requiring more and more and more information, including stuff around civil disturbance. Yeah, and like I'm, I mean, I jokingly said, "Oh, we'll go out there with gel blasters." I mean, like, <laughs> but in in fairness, I think that'd probably still get approved if you put that through Queensland Health because they would acknowledge that that's <laughs> a gel blaster would be an appropriate response in your case. <laughs> we. We were back and forth quite a bit for our bush time series of events, but we did. We had a consultant, uh, HEST paramedic, uh, HEST paramedical, sorry, who also provide our ambulance services, uh, design the plan with us. Um, so because we were essentially trying to make sure as a large scale festival, we wanted to make sure we were best practice and gold standard because we can't afford uh, da brand damage, let alone uh, an issue on site where somebody actually contracted COVID, for example, and, and we were wearing the responsibility for that. Um, but a, a lot of it really, I, th I think there's a lot of scary documentation in there, but some of it I think you can put through fairly simple, straightforward, not applicable in this circumstance, and I think it would still be approved, particularly if it's only going to the public health unit, which it would for the scale as compared to uh, going over that 1500 mark, I think it is, and ending up at the Chief Health Officer's office, you know. Yeah, Ben, just a curiosity question when you're looking at um, what business might look like in the future for yourselves, and that's why you're sitting on this uh, session today. Your scale is so big that I would imagine if you were thinking along the lines of our business models where we, you know, we camp from probably 80 to 500 people with the different people that are representative here, that wouldn't even be viable for you, would it? No, and that, that's the problem. We've, you know, anecdotally around here, we sort of say that to open up for a weekend, because we, we manage all of our own sewerage infrastructure, we've, we've got a council version of sewerage infrastructure, we manage all our own water, um, so everything is in-house. It's, it's quite an, an effort just to open, let alone the insurance considerations and everything on a 500-acre site. Um, but, you know, it really, for us to open on a weekend, we probably have to cough up 25000 before we start. So, and, and that'd be just in pumping the appropriate water, um, sewerage provisions. Uh, we've got a $2.5 million lake that we need to test the water pre and post uh, any event. Uh, that has to go to a laboratory for testing. You know, and the, the list goes on and on, of course, at this scale of venue. So at the moment, we really wish we had a 12-acre site <laughs> with one block of toilets because that would have suited us a lot better. Well, you can obviously have many of those, but... Um... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
to right. break it down to that. I mean, obviously we're all sitting here with uh, ears open and eyes open because, you know, it's interesting to see what you're facing compared to us. But I guess it's also, you know, there could be a potential competitor in our space, which is also an ally and a friend. So it's all of the above. Um, so it's an open forum for that reason. But I guess what's to stop you just going, um, is there a demand for people who want to, you know, get away and just need to be accommodated? There's no real saying that, you know, that a call down the road here can't have 2000 people stay in their hotel what's to stop you having x number of people or do you need the draw card or the magnet of the major event to get them there yeah that that, that that's a twofold thing really we um as a as a not-for-profit organization with the constitution we're dedicated that everything we do is really focused on the arts um so and it's very likely our focus will always remain that way um we, to, we can function as a campground and we have been able to for a long time, um, but it's, it's not what we do and it's not what we're good at. We, we recognise that. We're very good at putting on events. Uh, we're not very good at running a caravan park. And we, we, to shift to that now wouldn't make sense and it would be slightly outside of our constitution as well. It's not really what we're here for, you know. Does it make any sense to break your business model in half and have accommodation on one site and event at a different under two different complete models and therefore you're no longer an accommodated event? Uh, potentially, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a question for higher pay grades than me. But. <laughs> oh, well, I'm just letting you know that the likes of uh, the other sites represent him more than happy to accommodate some of your people if you want to run the event. <laughs> mm. Well, um, that, that's right. The, the, the sorts of things that potentially... Uh, we would look at is refer well referrals on for straight for starters because we we do we're getting asked now because people know that the Woodford Folk Festival is unlikely we haven't officially cancelled it but anyone would understand that that would be unlikely at this point um, and small you know the, the smaller events are ramping up and we'd ideally like to support that but the reality is I, I had a site inquiry the other day and they said look we're you know, want to run this thing for 500 people, but it just will never stack up and, and, and it can't be worth it for us. So referring those sorts of inquiries on uh, to an appropriate site, bearing in mind that, that many of these will have uh, noise issues. So it's not going to suit everyone's sites uh, that, that, you know, facilities that, uh, that potentially would be facing a noise issue at one o'clock in the morning. You know? Yeah. Not that they're certainly not dwarfs, uh, but you know, they typically the sorts of events that come and approach us are looking for um, assurance that they can carry out the event without issue from neighbours. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. I know that um, they're reshaping the Caloundra Music Festival and it'll be something like the Sunshine Coast Chamber Music Festival. I guess you're probably more across that than me. And I think they're breaking, you know, their festival out into multi-venue, spread across a bigger region. And therefore it would be actually going to, it's going to be a magnet for people wanting to stay in accommodation places like ours. I guess you could possibly be an alternative organiser for such things and spread your wings in that regard and still support the arts anyway, just a thought. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's right. And we do, for example, our Festival of Small Halls was intended to do that. And it's across four states now. And um, and I, I suppose, in all honesty, we don't have the human resources now to, to think fairly large scale either. There's literally myself and a front of house manager, our general manager director. And uh, so, so we're sort of uh, really in a holding pattern at the moment, trying to establish what it is that we do next. Uh, as I say, because of the, it's only recently we've cancelled those two events, our two mid-year events. Uh, so we're sort of having a good hard look at ourselves now, you know. Hmm. Okay. You know, thanks for letting us um, ask questions, be involved, and, um, yeah, and you've actually helped us immensely by giving us an interpretation of what they're requiring from you. So. Mm. Yeah, that's the only thing I thought I might have. Yeah, absolutely. We're um, definitely in regular communication, have been with four months for four months, I suppose, with Queensland Health. And, and obviously, due to the scale of the venue where they had an interest, so they were quite prepared to, to put some time and intention into it. Um, but the, the news is not good from our point of view. Post 50 people, uh, it's definitely a gap that needs to be addressed. And I imagine if they apply that across um, you know, accommodation industry generally, uh, it, and it doesn't make sense. Obviously, I know Cotton Tree Caravan Park, for example, will be full this weekend. That's probably 800 people. That's right. Uh, I don't see how that's greatly different. Uh, and we didn't either when we were putting our plans in. For example, at the start, they wanted 15 metres between campsites. 
uh, for us to have uh, 500 people here. Um, and, and from our point of view, of course, that seemed insane. We, we, we had, we, if, if that had have gone through, it's 500 people stretched over something that would have been 55 acres for us because of that, the nature of where our roads are, the separation, you can't achieve 15 metres, you know, even on a 500-acre site. So fortunately, that was revised back to five metres, and I've noticed recently now they have revised that back to five metres for events globally, so that at least helps. Uh, but obviously, there's disparity between what else going on in a caravan park and what's what's happening on an event site. So. Mm -hmm. You should you should go to any go to any fast food venue um, where you can sit down. You don't get QR coded. They're not cleaning their chairs and tables in between every use and all that sort of thing. And compare with what we have to do in our sites. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of inconsistency out there. Yeah. 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 It's, uh... Yeah, it's and it makes it very hard for the, for the public to, to know what to expect or to, to uh, deal fairly with organisations like ours as well. You know, they see one thing on one hand and then, as you say, Andrew, something different on the other. It's, uh, it's very frustrating. But listen, thanks, Ben. I appreciate you coming along and, and sharing your thoughts. And Danny, I'll echo Danny's comments about, you know, the th thank you. Yeah, um, thank going you. forward, if you want to talk some more about being, you know, more about the sort of the outdoor sector, uh, definitely come and talk to us. You know, we're more than happy to do so. Uh, Thanks very much. No, can I just add something? Yeah, sure, um, go if you like. As a local Woodford resident, or actually just down the road, the Away Kilcoy Road, so very close to your venue, I think it's um, really sad to hear that uh, you're in that position. Um, I think you guys bring a lot to the community and what you put back into the community, and it's sad to hear that you can't run those smaller events. Um, so good luck and um, let horses in and we'll ride up the hills up the back. <laughs> I'd well be up for that, Claire. Well, you, that may happen sooner than you think. <laughs> well, yeah, perhaps we need to talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. There. A good reason for both of you coming along today. Um, okay, so any other any other comments from anybody else? We're about 10 to, 10 to 12 now. Oh, sorry, just Tanya from Camp Kubi. I was a little late to the um, entry, so I'm just out near Toowoomba, for those who don't know. Um, I'm just going to say to Ben, too, all the best with what you're doing. Um, I go to Woodford and enjoy it and um, and wish you all the best um, with those changes. I, when you were talking, and I'm sure you're on it, but when you were talking, I was thinking it's like you nearly on site here. We're a very small site. We can only have 150 maximum, um, and we're a bush setting. Um, but um, yeah, I'd like to, see, could you potentially, and you probably already have actually section out your site. So you've got zones like on here, we even have four zones and we're only 50 acres. So I separate it out by having people in different zones and have different plans, I guess, for the different zones. Yeah, that's a good point, Tanya. We, we have explored that actually and, and the potential for running multi, uh, multi events at the same time. We found it's a little bit more difficult in our case than we'd first anticipated. And to be honest, a lot of the inquiry that we have uh, are really for exclusive access because they're often a, a cultural event uh, and they, they don't want the, uh, the mix. It's a very carefully curated event typically. Um, and mixing it with other events or mixing those populations, which inevitably we have to do because everyone's going to swim in the lake, becomes a difficult thing. As much as we'd like to think that that is achievable, uh, it's it's not as simple as we thought, I guess. And of course, we're you know no one's banging down our door at the moment, put, wanting to put an event on. You've, you've got to be fairly fairly game. Um, uh, for medium scale, sorry, there's quite a bit of small scale stuff around. But again, we're, uh, we've found it that we can't make it viable on this on the scale of what we do. So. Oh, fair enough. I was just thinking when you're talking about mountain biking or things like that, like you could actually designate native zone maybe for the mountain bikers. And oh, anyway, you know. yeah, so, um, but all the best. Yeah, you've got such a lovely site. I was just thinking you've got, and I love your lake. Um, but there was many years where people enjoyed the site without the lake as well. Um, so, I, you know, yeah. just thinking, you, you know, if you're going on there to mountain bike, you don't necessarily need to use a lake or if you're going on for, for a particular purpose. But, yeah, yeah. Um, my mind gets very excited when I think about 500 acres and what you could do from an outdoor education perspective on your 500 <laughs> acres. Um, yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, but all the best. Um, and sorry to hear about Woodford not going ahead this year. Thanks, Tanya. Yeah, yeah, definitely feel free to get in touch anytime. Like I say, we're looking for ideas and, and we have, we're actually in the process of exploring uh, mountain biking. But again, we'd, we've got to stay a little bit focused on, on our, uh, the, the cultural nature of the place and our constitution as well. So uh, that, that's something I, I wouldn't get ahead of myself on, I suppose. So, mm. All right. Well, thank you, Tanya. Thanks, Ben.
Uh, if there's nothing else from anybody else, I think we might um, call an early one today. Uh, thank you all for coming along. And um, the next of these meetings is on the 12th of March, so in two weeks' time. Um, yeah, so have a good uh, have a good fortnight. Perhaps we'll yeah. see you all then. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yes. Okay. See you, folks. Bye-bye. Thank you.